Hey everybody, welcome to the Pound for Pound Leader Podcast with Mike Kai. This is part two of an incredible interview that Mike Kai had with Dr. Robbie Sonderegger, clinical psychologist. And if you missed the first part, make sure you go and watch or listen to that first and then check this one out. But without further ado, let's check out this interview. So Dr. Robbie, how do you see um, artificial intelligence, AI, impacting mental health care, right? And, and do you see a place for it in your field? Um, wow. What a Chat GPT, right? <laughs> what a great AI. Question. It's crazy. Uh, I'm nervous, um, but yet intrigued. And so I look at, it's just a matter of time, I believe, before we'll have... Um, you know, chat BT style therapists where you can ask a question and the, the you know, automatic, um, automated answers through some kind of avatar will, you know, you build your own therapist. Who would you like? Male, female, old, young, you know, with a particular accent, a beard, f- f- perhaps, you know, a little bit like Smoke Sigmund Freud from Germany. <laughs> uh, you're smoking a pipe, yeah. And, and, then, and then you can get your answers to whatever questions that you have. Wow. And it will scan whatever research studies. Have you whatever. thought this through already? Because yeah, it sounds, yeah. <laughs> Have you already thought it through? Because it sounds like you already have thought it through. We have, yeah. Wow. We've thought it through. And, and we've, we've, we've gone to that place where we recognize it's a scary thing if we allow ChatGPT or AI to have its run of the day or, you know, to automatically generate these answers because we know that it's not actually automated. It's well and truly programmed and scheduled um, in terms of being very progressive, left-leaning um, in its in its ideologies. It yep. And so what would it look like if we were to program something that really was evidence-based, research-driven, outcome-oriented, or even biblically centered that we know that the truth is is profound um, and validated. So it's not just, oh, someone once said, but we've got confirmatory evidence for it. And if people would like to then get that kind of assistance, well, that would be a great stream to be able to have available. It's kind of scary because if you create your own therapist and it's left-leaning, I mean, this thing could say, I'm having a hard time relating with my wife. Ah, oh, you should get a younger one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm having a hard time with my job. Ah, oh, maybe you should quit. Um, you know, all of these Ideologies scenarios. Of the day, yeah. What if it gives you bad advice? Yeah. And that's why it needs to really be governed. There needs to be accountability and integrity attached to it. Um, and so those are my four criteria. You know, is, is this truth, you know, is this ancient timeless wisdom found yeah. in scripture? Is it evidence-based? Do we actually have research supporting this? And does it get results? Uh, so it has to be outcome oriented, not just, well, here's a good theory for you to ponder. Let's psychoanalyze you back to your childhood and spend years of psychoanalysis. No, get me to a solution. Let's be solution focused and, uh, and so that I can you know, pick myself up out of the gutter, dust myself off and get on with my life. Do you foresee maybe in the, less, in the next five years or less, the less need for a f- actual therapist on the phone on FaceTime or in person that it could possibly re- be replaced by some avatar that you created or that you subscribe to that you paid for I think it's inevitable now I know that there are many who would push back and go no we want the personal touch and I would say that's true for our generation mm-hmm. because we're used to it it's right. in the same way that if I'm at a supermarket I gravitate towards the person who I can say hi to to do the you know the cash out you know grocery yeah. um, you know exchange and, and and then for the next generation it's like no I, I I don't talk to people anymore I don't even f- talk on the phone anymore I'd rather talk with my thumbs and chat and so it, so different generations different wiring in our brain we've got a generation coming through now that literally had an internet enabled device attached to their arms as they were growing up I didn't have that. And yeah. so the next generation thinks in a binary way. It's ones and zeros. Uh, it's on and off. And so there's a different, <laughs> there's a different approach. And so I think it's only a matter of time where I actually relate to the avatar that I've created. Um, and it's personal and it's real for me. What do you see AI in pastoring and preaching? That can't happen. That can't happen? That, we cannot let it happen. That, we, yeah, that, that would be, yeah, Jesus... <laughs> He needs to come back. There's come no back. such thing as, a, as an AI Jesus. We need the real thing. Right, right. That can't happen. Yeah. It might happen. What, what's, your, what's your feelings? I've never done it before, but what's your feelings on sermon prep with ChatGPT? 
Um, for any pastor who might be listening mm-hmm. and, and thought, well, what a great way to, you know, write a sermon or even um, write a book, then I would say you are living a limp along life because you can't get a divine revelation from a exactly. machine. Yeah. You need to tap into the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit, well, well what, not only what do you want me to talk about, but, but what's your perspective on this? And what's the flip side of that? And, and that divine revelation is, is what we need. You, know, you can walk with Jesus. You can talk with Jesus. You can listen about, listen about him in a sermon. You can sing to him. You can mm-hmm. even yell his name when you hit your thumb with a hammer. But it's not until you get a revelation of who Jesus is, just like Peter did when Jesus said, so who do people say that I am? And Peter was walking and talking with Jesus. He saw it miracles. Right. Uh, and it wasn't until Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the, you are the Messiah. You, you, you're the son of God that Jesus turns around and says, one of, I think one of, the, one of the most profound statements ever made. Yeah, you see, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. Hanging out with me all these years, it, it's not enough. It wasn't enough. You needed a revelation from yeah. the Father. And it's not until we get a revelation from the Father um, that we are, on fire on on in the pulpit because we are delivering the word of god as opposed to a second generation revelation that some computer might have generated like steer clear please pastor yeah. consult Amen. the source since we're talking about leadership basically pastoring is leadership um what, what have you noticed about leadership styles that have adjusted positive or negative wise so i grew up in a generation where uh, I'd call it the generation of the benevolent dictator. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I grew up under that. The, yeah. the, the generation of the benevolent dictator. Awesome leaders, great leaders, definitely alpha males, powerful, strong, teachers of the word. It's kind of like I, I gravitated towards the harder basketball coach. So the harder basketball coach, um, he didn't end well. Um, but let's say Bobby Knight from, from Indiana University. Have you ever heard of him? Uh-uh. Okay. <laughs> I got to send, send you some clips of Bobby Knight, Indiana University. That was my favorite school. Uh, wanted to go there when I was a little kid. I'd play for Bobby Knight, but he was, he was really, a, a, they called him a tyrant. Okay. Uh, then I, I would have loved a guy like Mike Krzyzewski, who just retired. Uh, he was the, the, the understudy to Bobby Knight, Duke University, probably won the most next to him and. Uh, Adolph Rupp from Kentucky and uh, Dean Smith, they won the most titles. But Mike Krzyzewski, he just retired two years ago. So the changing of the guard of leadership is from a very dictatorial my way or the highway style to having that tail end of that style and be able to coddle athletes that are one and done. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yep, Going totally. for one year and then they turn pro the next year. Yep. Um, what have you noticed about church leadership styles from senior pastors in this new generation versus the older one? I, well, definitely there is a shift underway and it, it's necessary from the perspective of you can't be the old school um, um, dictatorial benevolent dictator, as you said before, um, with the generation that we have now. Literally, they will walk away. Yeah. And so as we become more sensitive, we actually understand, you know what, research even backs this up that it is more powerful to um, reinforce somebody positively in terms of effect and benefit than it is using negative motivation or some kind of, you know, um, I'm going to put you down in order to raise you up. It's basically the understanding that a pat on the back is only a few vertebrae away from a kick in the pants. And so (laughs) if it's more powerful to encourage somebody to build them up and you're going to get better results through positive reinforcement than you are negative reinforcement, well, maybe just maybe we should learn. Well, especially in today's society, because, you know, if if I've been getting negative reinforcement, now all of a sudden it's reinforcing how I don't feel about myself, how I do feel about myself. More in today's society, when we were kids growing up, Coaches just being hard, and yeah. and and some people thrived on that. You know what I'm saying? But it's a little bit like parenting. You know, that was the old school parenting style right. as well. The, yeah, the, the belt, the, the authority, the paddle, the authoritarian. You know, parent who would come on in, and yeah. you know, it's my way or the highway. And and look, that military style, you know, stereotype is was it had its day, but it had also you know people are still burned yeah. um, from that. And so we yeah. now know through research that not authoritarian but authoritative. 
mm. is the best way to parent. And so we understand that it's good to have firm boundaries. It's yeah. great to have high expectations, but you've got to start first with the relationship that rules before relationship results in resentment and rebellion. But relationship before rules results in respect and respect is the holy grail. And when you think about it, think about those Hollywood movies that are a dime a dozen. They've made it, you know, eighteen thousand different ways, sliced and diced. It's the it's the football team, the basketball team, the ice hockey team, the pick a team. It's the same movie every time, where the coach comes into a delinquent high school. All the kids are dropouts. You know, they're not functioning very well, and it's not the military guy. It's somebody who digs underneath the skin, but they have got firm boundaries. Hey, you rock up for training. Uh, you can you can you can have a position on the field when we play the game, but if you're late for training, you'll be benched when the game starts so but your choice and you know we so we've got these these firm boundaries mm -hmm. but they're not dictatorial yeah. in terms of you stupid you're right who do you think it's not the boot camp you know sergeant who's the drill sergeant who's you know trying to make him ring the bell it's somebody who gets underneath their skin and i love this part at the end of the movie not only do they win the pennant but the students or the the players they're they're improving in their gpa mm. they're Academics are improving because they, they need to, a certain GPA in order to stay on the team. And so my question is, what is it that the sporting coach understands that the geography teacher, the maths teacher, or the science teacher just doesn't get? Because they tried everything to be able to bring their grades up and the kid was still flunking. And then the sports teacher came along and not only helped them win the grand final, but they improved their academics as well. There is something to be said for relational leadership. I'd have to agree with you. Um, our, our daughter's high school volleyball team um, switched coaches this past year. So I'm not going to name any coaches' names, but they switched coaches. And um, for three years, she'd been under the same coach, and that coach left, and she wasn't sure if she wanted to come out for her senior year of volleyball, which is big. I don't know if I want to play. Um, and so she was discouraged. No matter who the coach is, I'm just going to train for my next college where I get recruited to. And the new coach, I helped hire him, by the way. Okay. I was part of that committee grateful for the old coach but looking forward to a new season this coach comes in and this coach i didn't see him yell one time to his team i've only seen him smile and encourage i've seen him get firm but not for, as firm as i would have gotten yeah and i'm watching this and this team actually my daughter goes back to the team she gets named co-captain she's part of the team now she loves it and they go from worst in the league to first in the league in one season there's something to be said for that, Mike. I look at that and I think that's a leader who is not only leading the team, but they're leading themselves. Mm. And I look at a leader who's yelling at the team, they're losing, they're losing their self-control as they lose their emotionality. So in other yeah. words, the more emotional you get, the less intelligent you become. So true. And, and so as you're losing it, you're actually losing the team because the team are gonna now lose respect for you because you have no leadership of yourself. Manage your own emotions and then let's see how well you can manage the team. And uh, so that's the, that's the call out to all leaders. You wanna be a great leader? Yeah. Start by first learning how to lead yourself. I've been watching more college coaches lately in volleyball or even in basketball and most of them are calmer than maybe five years ago calmer on the sidelines they might be struggling on the inside yeah. you know what i'm saying but on the outside they're handling themselves very very, very well because well, they're in the public eye too at the same yeah. time so it's it's interesting one of the things that we as 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 parents are all concerned with because we know it deep down is like is my child spending too much time on screens and we know the answer already um is absolutely but we we still we're so busy in our lives that it's like well I just I just need them to you know not distract me for the next little while so I'll put them on screen again and again and again and, and it becomes almost like the surrogate parent the babysitter yeah but we are in an experiment where we don't know what the long term consequences are fully yet we're seeing it now so as we said before young people are growing up especially the z gen um or generation z as you like to call it here in the states uh so we the rest of the world we call it the z generation uh it's it's z gen z is z <laughs> i know when i went to south A south africa abc the xyz yeah it's z i mean why it's, it's not z e d it's anyway moving on anyway so they as we said before they're growing up with a binary mindset now binary means ones and zeros and so one means on and zero means off 
we indicated before that if you have a black and white on and off mindset, it is an immature mindset. So we know from the Zen Jeds, Zen Jeds, Gen Zeds. So you're not as open, <laughs> not as open. Not as open, well, more fixed in your conclusions. Okay. And so we know that 77% of Gen Zeds who have entered into the workforce now have quit their job over a negative interaction likely with either a colleague or a boss. Mm. So when the boss is offending them in some way, right, I quit. And this is the same what you would do with a computer game. So when you're playing a computer game and you've got three lives, um, but if you don't do really well in your first life, you'll press restart. You won't even go for the other two lives. Even though you had two more lives up your sleep, you just go restart and I start the entire game from scratch so that I can do well in the first life to be able to go further with my other two as well. And so that binary mindset makes us quit jobs, quit relationships. I just quit. Uh, if I'll restart, but life doesn't work that way. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a hard lesson that's about to come down the pipeline. And so, I mean, that's obviously one indication. And, not, and the second is, of course, creativity dies. Um, because I'm fed so much information, I don't have time to, to dream, to stop, to sit. So that when my kids say, Dad, I'm bored, I'm fond of saying, fantastic, this is a good thing. Because when you are bored, and I do not give in to the whining of pain, because pain is a threat to my child's survival, and so as far as their brain is concerned, I need entertainment or pleasure to counter this threat of pain. And so they're wanting some kind of device, anything that starts with I. And so, uh, and so if I resist that temptation to give in to that, and I say, hey, this is a great thing because now your imagination can kick in. You can actually get creative and start to explore or ponder what could I do that doesn't actually involve something being fed to me, but that I myself can create or go out and consider to entertain myself. And that forced engagement is an essential component for artistic, creative, intelligent, abstract, uh, mature thinking. And so I want to create my kids to be great thinkers. And for that reason, wait for it. My kids get one to two hours of screen on a Friday night, one to two hours of screen on a Saturday, one to two hours of screen on a Sunday. And that's it. During the school week, there is no screens unless it's essential for homework or an assignment. And so we are a screen free family um, during that other time. We can't eliminate it altogether because that mm. would be like chopping off your child's arm. Mm -hmm. They need it. And this is the day and age in which they live. And so, but let's also promote other great healthy thought patterns too. If you could make one policy recommendation to better support mental health in the United States and abroad, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> on the spot, let me shoot from my hip and say, compulsory military service let that one drop for like a lead balloon and, and let me explain why and let me explain what for with conditions yep. as national guard yep. defending the nation not yep. to be deployed on overseas assignments to fulfill somebody's political agenda but to be able to say i am going to engage in the disciplines of of um physical rigor of learning how to be healthy around firearms to understand um, the importance of protecting one another, so values and virtue. And if I'm a conscientious objector to that, we don't want to live in a you know dictatorship where or I'm free, freedom first, absolutely all the way. Well, great, then you can be deployed in some kind of um, social or humanitarian um, endeavor to be able to provide those social services, those those nat those those um, infrastructure works or whatnot. Once again, promoting those same disciplines, hard work, physical labor. Um, and I think if young people went through that, where they are having their Diet regulated, sleep regulated, exercise regulated, um, having morals and, and, and ethics built in uh, as a compass to their lives. That something is worth fighting wow. for, not yep. just fighting against. Well, I think we would have much less crime, much less mental illness, much less uh, relationship breakdown. That I, We would have more great leaders in the United States of America because they are learning the discipline of how to lead themselves as warriors. Um, and I and I see that I see that in places like Switzerland, where military conscription is present, not to be deployed on overseas mission, but where every family has a machine gun at home, fully loaded with ammunition, the whole kit. Every family has a machine gun. Really? Every family has a machine gun. And yet there is never, wow. ever uh, an assault. There's there's no one who's out there having, you know, uh, use of that machine gun. The machine gun 
I have respect for that weapon yeah. now because I've been through um, compulsory military service. So um, the draft, another word for it is a draft, but without sending them overseas, but for home protection, yep. uh, homeland security. Um, when you look at that, are you, are you saying that do that before you go to college or do that or college? Um, so in various different places around the world, it doesn't have to be a three-year college replacement. It could be a three-month endeavor or a one-year mm. endeavor and that that's the gap year in fact it would yeah. be great if young people had a gap year before going to college yeah. just to be able to enter into college that little bit more mature a little bit more seasoned yeah. as opposed to just you know ticking a, a an item off the list so that i got a qualification that i can go out into the workplace without having life discipline you know and, I'm, and I'm, i know it's controversial for me to say these things but i just think uh, you know yeah. it, it, what a great thing i think if, so there, too. if there was a national disaster if there was a disaster in florida where another hurricane or you know cyclone has come through great we get deployed on mission to do what to build community to support people and when you are placed in a position of being a hero you're engaging superhero powers not just superpowers because yeah. you could be a super villain, but superhero powers. What's a superhero power? You are serving one another, and that doesn't exist anymore. Or unless you volunteer and go out and you know the, the lifeguard or the, the you know voluntary fire service or whatnot. But those people, they're the best of the best. Yeah. They're great leaders. Yeah. They're, they're, they're the kind of son or daughter that you want your your son or daughter to marry. I like that. They do that in uh, South Korea. They do that in Israel. Um, now Switzerland. Yeah. realize that that's that's awesome i think a gap year is wise at many levels it's not essential but for many young people a gap year is great because i get to experience something other than school and when i have experiences beyond theory and textbooks and i can go out and see how my life plays out in the real world it may actually serve to better inform my choices. So I know a lot of families discourage a gap year because they're afraid if my young son or daughter has this opportunity to go out and experience the world, they may not want to go to college. Well, what a great thing if they don't want to go to college because they've found something that is even more purposeful. In a day and age where college is questionable at best now where we go well we thought that college is good because it gives you a better career path and you'll end up making more money no not so not these days yeah uh and so if you have got a college career path that you believe this is your this is this is what you are equipped empowered and put on the earth to to engage this if there's a particular call that god wants to you know channel you down oh fantastic go to college and get equipped and empowered like i did i can't just be a psychologist i did nine years at university but thank god there was a gap year or a few gap years i, I didn't go back till till i was 20 and i thank god for that because i went out to experience the real world i even took a break in between my university years and went on missions uh, overseas and, and worked for a year in africa and in that year realized, you know what? I need more education. I need to go back and do some, some post-grad studies, masters and PhD in order to truly go where God wants me to go. And so they're mature decisions, not just I've spent you know 12 years at school, then I went straight into college and did another three or four year bachelor degree and then a two year, you know, maybe mm -hmm. perhaps a master's degree. And, and I came out with zero life experience but plenty of academic, you know, head knowledge and, and, and theory. Well, maybe for some young people um, who nowadays, because we know when people, you know, change their degrees, like they change their socks, um, switch, switching back and right. forth. I'm still trying to find myself. Yeah. Um, what, what, what should I be doing with my life? Great yeah. question. Get some experience. Yeah. It's a rare person that goes off straight from a f senior year of high school in America to their freshman year of college, knowing and declaring their major uh, right off the bat. And so most of us pick psychology because it's flexible. Sorry, no pun intended, but seriously. <laughs> and by the way, I did, I, I was a psych major, but I, Come never, on. I never finished. Um, and here's why. I did this class called Unit Mastery. I couldn't master myself to finish that class, wow. which was basically you go in and take tests. It's just take tests, read the chapter, go take tests. Anyway, I flunked Unit Mastery Psychology, but here I am today. So. <laughs> Praise God for that. Dr. Robbie, it's been awesome having you. We talked AI. We talk in leadership styles. We're, we've been talking 
child rearing uh, and social media and all of that conscription service. We're talking all gap years. What a what controversy. a great controversy, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm glad you're here for such a time as this. You're here at Inspire Church and you are going to Maui in a few days. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. We're very, very grateful for you. It's always a pleasure. Thank always you. Always good to have you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thank you so much for joining us on the Pound for Pound Leader podcast. I am your host, Mike Kai. And I just got done interviewing my good friend, Dr. Robbie Sonderegger, all the way from Australia. A nice tidbit for you. He was hired by the royal family. Well, I think Princess Diana did uh, to teach their sons how to ski in Switzerland. And that's what he did. Uh, that's his claim to fame. But actually, he's great in this space. And I'm sure you got a lot out of it. And then go to my YouTube and subscribe, please, at Mike Kai for all the latest sermons, content, shorts, longs, all that. Until then, thank you so much for joining me. God bless you and aloha. Thank you.